In 2009, a global hacking operation targeted government websites in the US and South Korea and nearly brought them to their knees. Six years later, another attack struck banks across the world, leading to losses in the millions. The link between the two attacks? A sinister hacker organization called the Lazarus Group. Shrouded in mystery and always a step ahead of international law authorities, the Lazarus Group has been launching attacks at government and financial institutions for more than a decade. Their high-tech weapons range from brute force attacks to digital heists. Yet, despite the notoriety of their attacks, the identity of the members of the Lazarus Group remains covert. The origins of the Lazarus Group are full of secrets. Even the group's name changes depending on who you speak with. Appleworm, Group 77, Hidden Cobra, Red Dot, Huis and Zinc are only some of the names international agencies use to refer to this cyberspace menace. However, the internet trail left by the attacks, IP addresses and the initial targets all point to the same place of origin, North Korea. Unfortunately, a direct connection between the country and the Lazarus group is far from conclusive. A definitive list of cyber attacks carried out by the group is also uncertain. The first cyber attack attributed to the Lazarus group occurred in 2009 and targeted the US and South Korean governments, financial institutions and news organizations. Digital forensics suggest the group may also have been involved in attacks launched two years earlier. In the mid and late noughties, the Lazarus group executed devastating hacking attacks, digital bank heists and ransomware attacks around the world. Although some were thwarted, the successful attacks were severe enough to put worldwide authorities on high alert. In less than a decade, the Lazarus Group established itself as an international cybercriminal threat that could not be ignored. In 2009, the Lazarus Group launched Operation Troy, a three-wave cyber attack that wreaked havoc on major government and financial networks in the US and South Korea. The first wave of Operation Troy was launched on July 4th, American Independence Day, and targeted US and South Korean websites, including the Pentagon, NASDAQ, the White House, and the New York Stock Exchange. The second wave, on July 7th, concentrated its efforts on South Korea and hit the National Intelligence Service, Ministry of Defense, National Assembly, and even the Blue House, the residence of the South Korean president. The third wave of Operation Troy, on July 9th, infiltrated the US State Department and South Korea's National Intelligence Service websites. The severity of the attacks stood in stark contrast to the simplicity of the technique, a relatively common brand of cyber attack known as Distributed Denial of Service, or DDoS. DDoS attacks consist of multiple devices sending requests toward a specific IP address. The purpose is to overwhelm the targeted network or server, forcing it to deny service to all regular traffic. In this attack, the Lazarus Group used a particularly malicious code called W32 Dozer, which allowed them to take control of approximately 20,000 computers, according to the South Korean Intelligence Service. This created a network cybersecurity experts call a botnet. The actual attack was now ready to begin. The code, referred to in cybersecurity circles as a worm, is specifically engineered to compromise Windows computers and is likely distributed through email. When the email is opened, the code changes the computer's system, placing a Trojan code inside and preventing the machine from rebooting. The code used by the Lazarus Group, aptly named Trojan Dozer, not only launched the DDoS attack, but contained instructions to keep sending infected emails to new addresses. Trojan Dozer also had a self-destruct function that would delete crucial data from the infected machines and render them inoperable. Surprisingly, Operation Troy's primary objective wasn't to steal confidential data or bring targeted sites down. Instead, the main purpose of this three-pronged attack was to disrupt the websites long enough to cause massive and wide-ranging damage. In that sense, the attacks were a success. When cybersecurity experts examined the length and scope of the attacks, they suspected the source of the DDoS assault was North Korea. The evidence. Not only were the US and South Korea the primary targets, but the North Korean government tested a ballistic missile on the same day as the attacks. In addition, international sanctions imposed on North Korea had been intensified only a month earlier. 
Yet the National Intelligence Service of South Korea didn't find conclusive evidence pointing toward their northern neighbor. However, infected networks were found in 16 countries, but not North Korea. The Lazarus Group became a hot topic in cybersecurity circles. Who were they? Where were they? Would they strike again? The hackers were proving to be as mysterious as they were dangerous. The 2009 attacks were only the beginning. After Operation Troy, two more DDoS attacks were launched against South Korea in 2011 and 2013. These attacks were similar to the original, but were notably more sophisticated. It demonstrated the Lazarus Group's ability to quickly develop more efficient tools to counter new security measures. The 2013 attacks also provided more evidence that the North Korean government may be behind the group. One of the IP addresses utilized, for instance, was also used in previous cyber attack attempts traced back to the country. In 2014, Sony Pictures was hit with a severe hacking attack. The perpetrators dubbed themselves Guardians of Peace. As it would turn out, this name was another alias of the Lazarus Group. Unlike other attacks by the group, the Sony Pictures hack had a clearly stated purpose. The hacker group announced they were targeting the company over the release of The Interview, a comedy co-produced, co-directed, co-written by and starring actor Seth Rogen. The plot of the fictional movie revolved around an assassination plot targeting Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. The attackers utilized specialized malware that allowed them to gather sensitive information about Sony Entertainment Network and its employees. The stolen data included employees' personal information, salaries of high-ranking executives, business and personal emails, and even information on employees' families. Additionally, the hackers stole movie scripts, production plans, and copies of movies that were still awaiting public release. However, the final blow that the hacker group threw was arguably even worse. In addition to the malware, a wiper was also inserted into the computer network with a singular purpose, to destroy the software infrastructure by deleting critical files. The wiper was deployed successfully, and the Sony Pictures network went down quickly. The results were devastating and cost the entertainment company about $15 million in damages. The hackers demanded the immediate withdrawal of the movie while the attack was in progress. The group also threatened any theatres screening the film, claiming such cinemas themselves would become targets of terrorist attacks. In the face of those threats, numerous theatres in the US opted out of screening the movie. Following a wave of cancellations, Sony Pictures cancelled a formal premiere of the interview. Instead, the movie received a digital release with limited theatre showings. The motivation behind the hacking attack presented another strong piece of evidence connecting the Lazarus Group and the North Korean government. In fact, intelligence structures in the US suspected that the North Korean government actively supported and sponsored the attack. Despite the seemingly undeniable connection, Pyongyang officially denied any involvement in the attack. The Lazarus Group was also responsible for several digital bank heists. The group exploited system weaknesses in the SWIFT banking system and deployed malicious software to target banks in several countries between 2015 and 2017. Banks located in Vietnam, Ecuador, Mexico, Poland, Bangladesh and Taiwan were victims. Of those attacks, the Bangladesh heist in 2016 proved to be one of the biggest in the Lazarus Group's history and earned them even more international notoriety. The Bangladesh Bank, the central financial institution of Bangladesh, had an account in the US in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. To control those funds, the Bangladesh Bank used the SWIFT network. However, the institution's access points for SWIFT weren't sufficiently secured leaving the account vulnerable to attack. The Lazarus Group didn't hesitate to take advantage of this exploit. During a weekend in February, when the bank's offices closed, the Lazarus Group entered the computer network of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and obtained crucial information. In particular, the group learned the transfer methods as well as the credentials that the Bangladesh Bank used for payments. It suspected that the hackers had insider help during the process. With this information, 
the Lazarus Group made approximately 35 fund transfer requests to accounts based in the Philippines and Sri Lanka. In all, more than $851 million was requested. Due to the considerable amount requested, most of the transactions were forwarded for further review. Yet five transactions totaling more than $100 million were completed. An estimated 81 million went to the banking system in the Philippines, while another 20 million went to other parts of Asia. Whilst the majority of funds were eventually recovered, the money that entered the Philippines exchanged hands several times, going from accounts registered to fake identities, exchanged for the local currency, then transferred to a different account. Investigations in several countries and institutions were launched. The Bangladesh Bank's own internal investigation found that the malicious code used to retrieve transfer data entered the bank's computer system. They also found striking similarities between their case and a similar hacking heist that targeted the Sonali Bank in 2013. Both attacks included possible help from an insider and took advantage of swift system exploits. Meanwhile, in the Philippines, an investigation was launched by the National Bureau of Investigation, looking into the account that received the funds that had then been converted into pesos. It was owned by a Chinese-Filipino businessman, suspected to have been involved in laundering the funds. While the identity of the businessman hasn't been confirmed, it's known that the money was to several casinos. The recipient operated from Macau, China, and reportedly used the funds to purchase casino chips or cover other casino expenses. The Anti-Money Laundering Council of the Philippines, working on the theory that the heist funds were laundered through casinos, started looking into possible casino connections with dubious bank accounts. These investigations, as well as those conducted by other government agencies, resulted in several lawsuits and convictions for money laundering. But unfortunately, authorities were no closer to the perpetrators of the massive Lazarus Group heist. The breaches that Andariel performs consist of breaking into confidential databanks and stealing sensitive information. Other cyber attacks committed by this subgroup include the aforementioned DDoS attack and attacks that may bring down important government websites. A US Army report issued in 2020 estimates that Blue Noroff consists of approximately 1,700 active operatives. The intel suspects this branch is responsible for assessing vulnerabilities in banking networks over a long period. Once determined, hackers systematically exploit the predetermined breaches in highly coordinated attacks. Blue Noroff uses various malware including Trojans and codes written to take advantage of specific operating system weaknesses. Blue Noroff also utilizes other hacking and cybercrime tactics such as phishing, Java breaches, server access, and so-called watering hole attacks. Blue Noroff is believed to have performed cyber attacks in 13 countries and compromised 16 financial organizations in less than a decade. While these numbers are striking, the list of attacks relates only to incidents that are known to be directly connected with the group. The group purportedly collaborates with other individual hackers and hacking groups from the criminal underground on occasion, making it possible that they is connected to even more heists. Meanwhile, the Andariel branch keeps a much lower but no less dangerous profile. This subgroup of Lazarus is characterized by stealthy operations and a constant focus on South Korea. They often target economic, defense, and government organizations in the country. The frequency and severity of Andariel's attacks on high security targets mean no US or South Korean organization is safe from the hacking group. The US Army report estimates Andariel is 1,600 members strong, and its operatives have assignments that include recon and vulnerability exploration and mapping out potential patterns for future attacks. While Andariel also uses malware, this division of the Lazarus Group has a broader selection of tools at its disposal. And Ariel exploits software vulnerabilities with techniques like macro, infected software updaters and installers, watering hole attacks, and false antivirus software, to name a few. Although the tools that both branches of the Lazarus Group use are well known, technology isn't the most problematic aspect of the group. The greatest issue that international cybersecurity forces face when dealing with these hackers is the group's elusive nature. Despite the investigations and reports, 
there is no direct link between North Korea and the Lazarus Group. The hackers remain anonymous and dangerous, and they are still at large. If you've enjoyed this report about the Lazarus Group, please show your support for the channel by liking this video and sharing it with friends. Subscribe to get notified about new videos from iExplained as soon as they come out. Thank you for watching.